sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Today, we'll be talking about the how long, oh God, cry of all the Christian martyrs throughout the history of the church, beginning from the first century AD. We're going to be talking about the seven seals of Revelation today. Let's begin. Revelation 5, 9 says, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood, you purchase for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. Jesus Christ is our Savior. He purchased us with his own blood because he wants to get us out of this mess that we call earth. Buying with blood is atonement language. So Jesus exchanged his life and death on this earth for our eternal life in heaven, repairing our wrongs against him with his own blood. He did this for the entire world. His sacrifice is what makes Jesus worthy to open the sealed scrolls in Revelation 6, which we will see is the unveiling of how Jesus plans to give us an eternal life. I'll be taking you on a journey into the seals of Revelation 6, which are what God uses us to bring us into a loving relationship with him. Because Christ was enthroned in Revelation 5, he is now the reigning king in heaven. So in Revelation 6, Jesus opens the first seal. In Old Testament times, people used family rings with the family name or personal rings with their names to mark or seal things that belong to them. The way that we use pens to mark things like books to say, this is mine. So if God is sealing something, he's saying, this belongs to me. And if you belong to God, guess what your gift is? That's right, I heard it, eternal life. But there are some conditions. God is giving us time to change and transform our hearts, and the seals are how he does it. But before we start, you need to know that the book of Revelation is a symbolic book. During the first century of the, first of the Christian church, people understood what these symbols meant, but since we don't, I'll be referring to the Old Testament where John, its author, derived these symbols from. The name of the book says everything. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, so it's not a secret. Revelation 1, verses 1 to 3 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, Revelation 1, verses 1 to 3, slide 4, No, there we go. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to show his servant, must so, so his servant what uh, sorry, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to show his servant what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Verse 3, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Please open your Bibles to Revelation 6. I'll be reading from the NIV version today, which is in the pews in front of you. Revelation 6, verse 1 through 2. All right. Revelation 6, verse 1 through 2 says, I watched as a lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, 
And there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown. And he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. If you notice, the horse is white, and the conqueror is dressed in white, and he's wearing a crown. And I've noticed that in the Bible, white represents righteousness and purity. Christ and his word are pure and righteous. In biblical Greek, the the book of Revelation has two words for crown, Stephanos and Diadema. Diadema is a royal crown, but Stephanos is a garland crown that Olympians would get when they won a victory. And Stephanos is what the original language describes this conqueror as wearing. Therefore, the breaking of the first seal points to the beginning of the preaching of the gospel, conquering sinners for Jesus Christ. When Jesus was exalted to the heavenly throne in his ascension in Revelation 5, the day of Pentecost began. The Holy Spirit descended, which was the starting point for the expansion of his kingdom. The Holy Spirit came down to earth, and as a result, his power was manifested in the expansion of the gospel, which began on the day of Pentecost in 31 AD, at the same time that Jesus was enthroned in heaven. And for time's sake, I can't explain it to you because we're only going to Revelation 6, but just know that that's that's what it is. (laughs) Thousands and thousands were converted in one day. And the writer in Revelation 6 verse 2 went out conquering, which is what the day of Pentecost is all about. The goal for Jesus is to conquer completely. He wants to obtain the victory of the salvation of our souls for an eternal life. Where? In heaven. So... The meaning of the first seal is not limited to just one particular time. The conquering is a continual process that Jesus does, and this will be finished at the second coming of Jesus Christ. The proclamation of the gospel is to prepare the world for the second coming of Jesus Christ. In Revelation 6, verses 3 to 4, John is once again invited to see the next seal. He says, When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. In Revelation, the color red represents blood and violence. Taking peace from the earth represents the rejection of the gospel, and the great sword, the great sword <laughs> is persecution. In Matthew 10, 34 to 36, Jesus explains, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Man's enemies will be the members of his own household. And you may be asking, why would Jesus want to do that? Let me explain. When one person in the household of faith wants to follow God's truth and another one doesn't, that will divide them. In Christian history, these divisions caused persecution. In the first century, Christian Jews were shunned by their own family members, which is why they formed communities where everyone shared their homes and food with each other. But later on, it got more intense. The blood of some of the great Christian martyrs was sacrificed. They were killed for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So seal number two is the taking of peace from the earth because the gospel always divides those who accept it and those who reject it. Let's go to Revelation 6, verses 5 to 6. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the, the third living creature say, Come, I looked, 
And there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages and six pounds of barley for a day's wages. And do not damage the oil and the wine. In verse 6, if you notice, the rider is holding some scales in his hand which is what they use to measure food in Bible times. But in order to understand these symbols, where do we need to go? Yes, the Old Testament. So Leviticus 26, 26 says, I'll just read it to you. When I cut off your supply of bread, 10 women will be able to bake your bread in one oven and they will dole out the bread by weight. You will eat, but you will not be satisfied. Ezekiel 4.16, he said to me, Son of man, I'm about to cut off the food supply in Jerusalem. The people will eat rationed food in anxiety and drink rationed water in despair. So in normal, normal circumstances, a, day, a day's wage could buy enough food for the entire family. But during famine, they couldn't buy enough food for themselves because the price of food was so inflated. So the announcement of Revelation 6.6 6, is the announcement of a great famine. But remember, the book of uh, of Revelation is not literal. It's a book of symbols. Revelation 6.6 is a symbol of a spiritual famine because of the rejection of the gospel in the second seal. In Amos 11.12, Amos talks talks about a spiritual famine saying, the days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. So because the second seal represents the rejection of the gospel, When this happens, what always follows is a shortage of God's word. In the Bible, grain grain regularly stands for the word of God. Luke 8, 11, Jesus says this. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. The black color of the horse represents the word of God becoming darkened, brothers and sisters. In the Bible, black always stands for deep spiritual darkness, symbolizing symbolizing the absence of the gospel after rejection and persecution. But there's a promise in the last words of Revelation 6.6, do not damage the oil and the wine. In the Bible, oil symbolizes the Holy Spirit and wine symbolizes salvation because wine represents the blood of Christ and life. What John is saying here is that even during a spiritual famine, the Holy Spirit is always present and at work because salvation is still available to the people who reject God's truth if they say sorry and repent. Let's move on to the fourth seal, Revelation 6, verses 7 to 8. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth if you notice the color of the horse it's pale biblical greek uses the word chloros which means pale and color of decay in other words the rejection of the gospel in the second seal has led to the spiritual famine in the third seal which has resulted in spiritual death in the fourth seal Now let's dive a little deeper into the second part of Revelation 6, verse 8. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. So the wild beast is a new entity that's added. 
when God brought his people out of Egypt, he made a covenant with them. According to this covenant, he promised the people of Israel that he'd bring them into the promised land. And just so you know, the covenant and the Ten Commandments are the same thing. In Deuteronomy 4.13, Moses says, He declared to you his covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he commanded you to follow, and then wrote on two stone tablets. In Exodus 19, verses 5 to 6, this is the message that God had Moses preach to the Israelites. This is his, his last sermon to the Israelites, by the way. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. All, although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Now, according to this contract, God promised Israel that he would be with them in the promised land, blessing them and providing for all their needs. But a contract, as you all know, always has two parts, a promise and a condition. In Leviticus, slide 12, in Leviticus 26, Verses 3 to 9, we see the first part of the contract, the covenant blessings. The blessings God promised were conditioned to Israel's faithfulness and obedience to his Ten Commandments. Leviticus 26, verses 21 to 26, is the second part of the contract, the covenant curses. These curses would only happen if Israel failed to keep their end of the contract. Let's see what the curses are. For time's sake, I'm going to refer to the New American Standard Bible for the rest of Leviticus. It's just a better translation from biblical Hebrew to English for these verses. Verses 21 to 26 says, um, Yet, if you show hostility toward me, are unwilling to obey me, I will increase the plague on you seven times according to your sins. I will let loose among you the beasts of the field. And if by these things you are not turned to me, but act with hostility against me, then I will act with hostility against you, and I will strike you seven times for your sins. I will bring upon you a sword, which will execute vengeance for the covenant. And when you gather together in your cities, I will send pestilence among you, so that you shall be delivered into enemy hands. When I break your staff of bread, ten women will bake your bread in one oven, and they will bring back your bread in rationed amounts so that you will eat and not be satisfied. So the covenant curses come in four expressions. Sword, pestilence, famine, and wild beasts. Sword is the first part of Leviticus 26, verse 25. I will bring upon you a sword, which corresponds to the red horse and the second seal of Revelation 6. Famine is the second part of, Le of Leviticus 26, 26. They will bring back your bread in rationed amounts so that you will eat and not be satisfied. This corresponds to the black horse and the third seal of Revelation 6. Pestilence is the third part of Revelation 26, verse 25. I will send pestilence among you. This corresponds to the pale horse and fourth seal of Revelation 6. Wild beast is the first part of Leviticus 22, 22. I will let loose among you the beasts of the field, which is what happens when people turn their backs on God. Since he's rejected, he leaves them to their own will and allows enemies to attack them without his protection. These same covenant curses are mentioned in the Old Testament with the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel, warning Israel what would happen if they did not return to God. Ezekiel 14, 21, for this is what the sovereign Lord says, how much worse will it be when I send against Jerusalem my four dreadful judgments, sword, famine, and wild beasts and plague, to kill its men and their animals. So when God leaves you to yourself, be aware of the four covenant curses. God does not want to curse you. He's just leaving you alone so you can live the way you want without him until you realize you were better, out, you were better off without him, with him all along. 
When the prodigal son leaves his father's house rejecting his, his blessings, his father never stops loving him. He just waits for him to come back home so he can bless him again. When he moves away and chooses a different lifestyle, the son has to learn from the school of hard knocks until he, realize, he, until he realizes he was better off with his father all along. The covenant curses are the school of hard knocks, brothers and sisters. So we can learn and we can realize that we're better off with our heavenly father. When Israel was on their own, an enemy would come for war. Sword, I need water. <laughs> Byron, can I have water? <laughs> My throat. <laughs> Thank you. So when Israel was on their own, Thank you so much. The enemy would come for war, which is sword. And as a result of that, famine would come. Then they die, pestilence. And finally, in ancient times, the houses were left empty and wild beasts would come in to inhabit those houses. There are three different applications to the first four seals of Revelation. Symbolic, universal, and historical. Let me drink a little bit. <clears throat> so the symbolic application thank you byron the symbolic application of the first seal represents the gospel preached the universal application of the first seals represented by the gospel bring, being preached starting from 31 a.d on the day of pentecost all the way up until the second coming of christ the historical application was represented in the first century when the Christian church was at work preaching the gospel starting on the day of Pentecost. Then, guess what? It spread like wildfire. Now for the second seal. The symbolic application of the second seal represents the gospel rejected. The universal application of the second seal is whenever the gospel is preached, there's always rejection of it because God's truths have never been popular. Even though people receive it and experience peace, the preaching of the gospel makes other people angry. So they reject it, refusing to surrender to God's spirit. As a result, they persecute those who accept God's truth in its purity. It happened in the past, it happens in the present, and it's going to happen until the second coming of Jesus Christ. The historical application of the second seal is represented in the second and third centuries A.D. with the persecution of God's faithful Christians by those who rejected the pure gospel. Let's move on to the third seal. The symbolic application of the third seal represents the gospel as scarce, their spiritual famine. The universal application of the third seal is this. As a result of the persecution, there's spiritual famine. So people who reject the gospel are left to themselves, but they're still struggling to find meaning in this life. Since they reject God's spirit, they, can't, they cannot find anything that's going to satisfy the hunger of their soul. The historical application of the third seal represents the false teachings in the Christian church during the 4th and 5th centuries, which is represented by the scarcity of the gospel and its purity, hence spiritual famine. Automatically, this will lead to spiritual death, which brings us to the 4th seal. The universal and symbolic applications of the 4th seal are represented by spiritual death. The historical application of the 4th seal corresponds to the Christian church during the Middle Ages. During the post-Reformation period after the 16th century, the Christian church of the fifth generation was completely dead. This was the time of the scholastics who liked to speak of the great reformers and quote them, but the purity of the gospel was completely dead. They focused on philosophies over the pure, simple truth of God's word. This is the spiritual death that the fourth seal of Revelation is portraying, brothers and sisters. In the enthronement of Christ, in chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation, the preaching of the gospel started and the Holy Spirit descended on the disciples and the church to proclaim the gospel to the world. The gospel spread like a wildfire 
in the first century AD. Unfortunately, the church is always situated in a hostile world that does not respond favorably to the gospel. This creates division. As a response to the division, there's persecution. After this, Constantine um, had a false conversion in 312 AD, which caused people to respond to Greek philosophies and traditions over the simple truths of God's word, which caused spiritual famine. It got so bad that by the time we reached the Middle Ages, the pure truth of the gospel was completely overshadowed by philosophies. Deep spiritual darkness always leads to spiritual death. By the end of the Middle Ages, known as the medieval period, there was a reformation in a small minority of Christians, which brings us to the fifth seal. Revelation 6, verses 9 to 10 says, When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar of the, the altar, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? So underneath the symbolic altar of sacrifice are the souls of those who have been slain because of what? The word of, the word of God. Yes, their faith. God's righteous people were persecuted and they died. So they're crying out to God for justice. God is portraying, I mean, not God, John. John is portraying the righteous ones, but through Jesus because it's the revelation of Jesus, John portrays the righteous ones as a sacrificial offering to God. In Old Testament times, the sacrifice was slain and put on the altar, but the blood was poured underneath the altar. God's righteous people are symbolic of a sacrificial offering to God, But their blood is crying out from underneath the altar, asking for vindication. How long, O God? How long, O God? Has always been the cry of God's faithful yet oppressed people. We see it all over the Bible. Psalm 79, 5. How long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? Habakkuk 1, verse 2. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? The cry of God's servants in the fifth seal represents the cry of all of God's righteous people throughout history. The purpose of the fifth seal is to show God's sealed people who are unjustly treated and afflicted that their prayers are indeed heard. As a response to their cry, God's sealed ones are told to rest for a while in verse 11. In biblical Greek, the word used is anapausontai, which means they shall rest. So they're put to rest temporarily through death, but they are promised white robes. Like I said before, the seven seals are rooted in Old Testament um, covenant curses. In Israel, there were always a few faithful ones, but as a whole, when, unfa- when they were unfaithful to God as a whole group, everyone had to suffer. So since the first century AD, this has been the plight for Christians as well, as we've learned about in the scene with the four horsemen and God's sealed people. So God allows the covenant curses so they can wake, so they can wake us up and we can go, oh, No wonder this is happening. I'm outside of God's protection. In the book of Judges, after experiencing the covenant curses, Israel cries out to God in repentance, which is what we have in the fifth seal, people crying out to God in repentance. None of us is perfect. We all need to cry out to God. We've fallen short of God's righteousness, so we all need to repent. In the sixth seal, 
God is answering their cries by coming to save them, turning his fierce anger against their enemies. Revelation 6, verses 12 to 14. Let me drink some water. Water is life. <laughs> Revelation 6, 12 to 14 says, I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat, goat hair. The whole moon turn blood red and the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind the heavens re, um, receded like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place let me tell you something in matthew 24 29 joel 2 10 and 31 Isaiah 13, verses 10 and 13, and Isaiah 50, verse 3. We have the same exact phenomena. This supernatural phenomena is exactly the same that's associated with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Go check those verses when you get home. In Revelation 6, verse 11, God tells his faithful martyrs to rest for a while promising to come one day to judge and deal with their enemies, finally bringing their affliction to an end. In the scene of the sixth seal, this promise is being fulfilled. It's a precursor to the second coming of Christ. Let's move on to verses 15 through 17. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks, of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of, of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can withstand it? In biblical Greek, verse 17 reads more like this, because the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand? The last word used in, orig in the original language is stathenai, which means to stand. These are the enemies of God's people, the ones who afflicted God's sealed people, because remember, a seal is more like a marking of something that belongs to you. So God's children who belong to him have been afflicted, and he's coming back with a vengeance to vindicate what belongs to him. God is coming to our earth to bring vindication to his faithful people and to deal with with their enemies, bringing judgment on them because of the harm they caused his own. So if you're being shunned because you want to do things the way God wants instead of what's accepted by the people around you, Peter tells us in Acts 5.29, we must obey God rather than human beings. That was the kindergarten and primary memory verse last week. The message of the seven seals is intended to provide hope to you, God's sealed ones. For time's sake, I can't get to the seventh seal, but you'll find it on my YouTube channel this October. And just search for my name, Lynette Laporte, on YouTube, and I'll have a playlist called Bible Studies in Revelation. Anyway, the experience of Israel is being applied to God's sealed people in the Christian church. The seven seals of Revelation are intended to be God's method of making his people victorious he wants you to wear the stefano's crown and not follow the one wearing the diadema god only uses the covenant curses to wake up his people so they can realize that life is better with god and then just say sorry for their sins so let's wake up this is the revelation of jesus christ to us Jesus made sure that the seals are structured, are structured exactly like his Sermon on the Mount of Olives. Check it out when you get home, please. Revelation 6, verses 1 through 8, and Matthew 24, verse 4 to 14, both speak of the general realities of the Christian age. Revelation 6, 9 through 11, and Matthew 24, verse 15 through 28, both speak about the era of the Great Tribulation. And finally, Revelation 6, 
verses 12 to 17 and Matthew 24, verses 29 to 31, both speak about the specific signs of the second coming of Christ. And I can't read it to you for the sake of time, but like I said before, you can find me on YouTube and study with me starting this October. Following the sixth seal is an interlude in chapter 7. The interludes in Revelation do seem like interruptions, but they're always used by John to bring theological understanding to what follows. Revelation 7 answers the last verse of Revelation chapter 6. Who is able to stand on God's day of judgment? It's about the 144,000. They are the ones who are able to stand, but it's not a literal number. For time's sake, I can't explain it to you. Just remember that Revelation is a book of symbols. John uses the I, I heard or I looked and I saw phrase to explain the same things. There are always two different things with the same exact meaning. Just know the sealed people of God are the ones that will be able to stand on the great day of Jesus' second coming and when he comes to take us home to live with him forever where there's not going to be tears or crying or pain. Do you want that? I invite you into a personal relationship with Christ so I can see you standing at the second coming of Jesus. You can do this by reading your Bible and praying every day. It's, it's really that simple, but not easy when we allow distractions. You need help to come back into God's covenant, his Ten Commandments. God will help you. Do you also need the fruits of God's Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He can help you with that too. Jesus says in John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. He says in John 15, 1 through 4, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must re remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So if you're, you think you're a good person... That's not good enough. Jesus continues in John 15, verses 18 through 21. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of this world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. Once you give your life fully to Jesus, he has promised promised that he will send an advocate for you through the Holy Spirit. In John 15, verses 26 to 27, Jesus says, when the advocate comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, and you also must testify. So, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, we will, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And remember who's sitting on the front throne. Let me drink some water, because I'm about to sing. Remember who's sitting on the throne waiting to justify you and waiting to answer your prayer. How long, oh God? Yes.
Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait till, till the song is, uh, I need to hear it. Can you turn up the song? There we go. Can we start it from, from the beginning? Uh, before the song starts, I would like you to close your eyes in prayer because I don't want you to look at me or listen to me and be like, oh, she sings so good. That's not what it's about. I need you to talk to Jesus. Close your eyes. Don't look at me. Close your eyes and talk to Jesus. This is, a, this is my prayer for you. You are holy. Oh, so holy. Hold on a second. I think two songs are going at the same time, right? Can we start from the beginning? Take it from the top. Thank you. Come, Holy Spirit. Be with everyone here. Convict their hearts so that they're able to stand when you come. You are holy, oh, so holy. You are holy, oh, so holy. What a privilege. And an honor to worship at your throne, to be called into your presence as your own. You are worthy, oh, so worthy. You are worthy. Oh, so worthy. What a privilege and an honor to worship at your throne, to be called into your presence as your own. You are faithful, oh, so faithful you are faithful oh so faithful what a privilege and an honor to worship at your throne to be called into your presence as your own you are faithful, oh, so faithful. Lord, you're faithful, oh, oh, so faithful. What a privilege and an honor to worship at your throne. To be called into your presence as your own, your own, your own, your own. I can search the heavens high I can search the earth below but there's no one there is no one no one I can search the heavens high I can search the earth below but there's no one there is no no one I can search the earth below, but there's no one, no one, no one, no one so holy, no one so 
so faithful there is no one no Now it's time to make a decision. Are you ready to make a decision for Jesus? He's coming soon. Some of, some of you think I may have just been here for the children's ministries, and yes, I was. Trust me. But the Holy Spirit has called every one of us to be his last day priests. We are the Seventh-day Adventist church called with a different message. We are not like everybody, all the other Christians who are sealed ones as well, by the way. God knows their hearts. God sees those who have a relationship with Christ. But if you don't have a relationship with Christ, let me tell you something. You're not going to be able to stand on the last day sword, famine, pestilence, wild beasts. Are you going to allow the wild beasts to take your soul and to take that promise that Jesus gave to you that he's going to come again? Do you want to be there? Are you tired of this mess we call earth? If you are ready to come into a covenant relationship with Jesus because we are now in the new covenant. Israel had the old covenant, but it's exactly the same as the covenant that Israel had. We're a new covenant because there's new believers. After Jesus died, he wants the same thing. He wants us to come into a covenant relationship with him. He wants to give you the fruits of the Spirit but I invite you to make that choice today. Who is ready to make that choice today, to stand for Jesus? If you're ready to make that choice, I want you to come up here now, and I'm going to pray for you. Don't allow embarrassment to keep you from coming up here because you won't be able to stand when the persecution comes. It's mild now, but it's, it's going to be a, an emotional and a mental persecution. Who is ready? Amen. Amen. Who is ready to come into a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ and accept Jesus as your Savior? Come into covenant with him. He died on the cross for you. He did not come to just conquer 144,000. He came to conquer the world, all nations, tribes, tongues, and people. He wants you to be able to stand. There's a great controversy going on between the evil one and Christ. He is so angry right now. But you know what? Guess what? Whose protection do you have when you're in covenant with Jesus? Whose protection? Is he going to protect you from the wild beasts? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's bow our head and close our eyes as I say my prayer for you. And dear Heavenly Father, I am so amazed at how the Holy Spirit has been working today. Heavenly Father, it is not my words. These are all your words. And this is not um, my power. This is the power of the Holy Spirit in me. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that that Holy Spirit comes out into everyone that has chosen to make that choice for you today. I pray that you fill each and every one of these people that are standing here with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you surround them with encouragement. Bring people around them that will encourage them. And when, the, when it gets really hard, Heavenly Father, remind them of this message. Remind them to abide in you. Because the enemies may come from your own household, but you need to put Jesus first. And everything else will fall into place. So if you're going through a storm right now, know that it's not God's will for you. I pray, Lord, for those that are going through a storm right now and that you just hug them and you bless them in a very special way today like you never have before. Everyone here, Lord, I pray that that light, that little flicker continues to grow, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray, we ask and we thank you. Amen.